Fancy sponsoring the Battle Fever Network? Fancy having your business, company logo, or our social media graphics, and your details being read out on our shows? Well, now you can. Get in touch with us on any of our social media platforms or email us at battlefeverpod at outlook.com. That's battlefeverpod at outlook.com. Hashtag keep the battle fever on. This show is brought to you by the Battle Fever Network. If you haven't already, then please follow us on all social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Just search the Battle Fever podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss a pod again. Hit that subscribe button and you're in. If you don't, We'll send Paul at Seas round to your door for a talking to. And trust me, you don't want that. You can talk for days. It is safer, really, just to subscribe. His red facet is beautiful. It's deep in history. And I know what I'll find when the place comes alive. I got that battle fever. When I was a young boy, my father said, to me put this scarf around your neck and sing the blues with me and now i am much older there's a place i want to be it's red faucet is beautiful it's deep in history and i know what i'll find when the place comes alive i got that Hi folks and welcome to the, the Battle Fever Network. We are on episode two of our um, Talking Football uh, Coaching and Management series and I'm delighted to say that today joining us is Livingston manager um, David Martindale. How are we doing David? Yeah, I'm all, I'm all right, I'm all right. Probably be a wee bit better if I'd managed to pick some points up on Saturday. <laughs> nah, not too bad to be fair, not too bad. Good, good. Before we go on actually, on Saturday I texted you and said that Actually, I thought that, that Livy were, were unlucky in the end. You know, I think the second half Rangers just have a wee bit more quality in the bench to call upon than yourselves. But that's probably the difference on the day. But Livy certainly gave a good account of themselves and a, and a good account of you. Yeah, well, I think I think you look at Gio, I, I think you've got to give Gio a wee bit of credit as well. I think he's... Well, what I've noticed since Gio's taken over is he's quite good at changing the game, changing the tactics slightly. It's not He has got an ulterior plan, a, a different plan. So he kind of changed his tactics... Uh, the full-backs came inside more. He had Tillman getting a wee bit closer to Mary, um, Kolak at a time. So he was getting more bodies in the box. The midfielders, he was asking them to break lines, get in the box in the second half. Whereas if you look at the first half, they probably stayed behind the game. So the game was more in front of them. Whereas they were trying to get in behind our midfield lines, in behind our defensive lines in the second half. And he peppered the box with crosses for the wingers. Um Stick giving them width in the game basically and putting more balls in your box, but the midfielders were getting asked to get in and get closer to Kolak. We get a wee bit lucky to be fair as well. I think there's probably a double yellow for Philip Kankar in the first half. We get a wee bit lucky there, so that we get the, the rub of the green, so to speak, in that one. But I think Kamara gets a wee bit lucky. He pulls the Pittman back on a counter on a turnover in our half, and then there's a handball with Kamara just outside the box in the first half. So much of a muchness, but I think the ref done pretty well to let the game flow on both occasions. Um, and then Kolak's goal, I think, is on side, to be honest. But I think Big Ayo's goal, I didn't see, I never really seen a foul in that build up either. Yeah. On reflection, I think we gave a good account of ourselves, but as you said, I think Gio changed the game in the second half and the quality of players that he could bring on kind of changed the dynamics of the game as well. We said we're going to split this up into kind of three today, if you like. Um, basically, your your influence, or, or sorry, who's influenced you in terms of coaching, etc., and how, how you came about to, to do what you're doing today. And then, obviously, it's the scene behind the curtain a wee bit for us in terms of how you actually come about to getting the, the Livingston job because we know that I think you've basically held just about every position 
and the yeah. club and you, before oh, coming yeah. before <laughs> before becoming the manager and then how how you set your side up you know and, and the differences because obviously you've just mentioned there you're going out against Rangers on Saturday with the quality the Rangers possess you're going to have a different approach to how you would go against you know I need a respect but Ross County or something like yeah. somebody who's more in your level if you like and where you'll yeah. be competing with directly so just things like that so in terms of yourself. Who, who influenced you as a as a younger, you know, because I know you played, obviously, junior level, I think. Who influenced you? Who would you always look up to as a as a manager or a coach or, or even a player? Probably, it's a, it's a difficult one, to be honest. I put part of myself in my own back, to be honest. I probably played below myself, played below my ability. So I don't really think I can say there was a lot of people influenced me from that point of view. There wasn't anyone where I said, oh, that's going to change how I look and how I play football, or I would love to be a coach, anything along the lines. It wasn't really like that. I spent a wee bit of time with Scott Pittman's dad, Stevie Pittman. Um, that was probably later on in my career when I was about 29, 30. I had always played amateur football with my pals. I kind of stuck with the pals that I grew up with in the scheme. But we had successful amateur teams, and I know people might find that hard to believe, but we'd won the Sunday Amateur Cup, we'd won the, the Saturday Amateur Cup. So we were, we'd fairly success, I had fair success playing Saturday, Sunday Amateur Football. I had the opportunity to go junior a few times, but I just stayed loyal to my friends and the teams I played with. I wasn't, and I'll be honest, it wasn't until I got charged when I was about 30 years old. I thought, do you know what, this might be my last chance to go and try and play at a wee bit of a better level. And I left and I went and played for a team called Pumferson and Scott Pittman's dad was the manager, Stevie. We had uh, Big Roddy Grant, you'll remember Big Roddy, big number nine, it was at Partick Thistle, St. Johnson, Roddy's now the commercial director at St. Johnson. Um, so we had a lot of good players, Derek McWilliams, Callum Mullen, just boys that had played a good level of senior football. And I would probably say that style of football, but B. Pitts' dad was probably one that got me more thinking about becoming a manager, becoming a coach. Eventually, obviously, got sentenced. I was on bail for a couple of years, and then I got sentenced, and I spent three and a half, four years in prison. When I came back out, Scott's dad was the manager of Broxburn Juniors, um, and that's roughly the equivalent now of Tier 6 in Scotland. Um, and he asked me to come in and play for him and be a player manager. And that's what I done. So I done that, and I played actually midfield with wee pits. That's how I managed to get wee pits along to Livingston. Um, so it was me, me and wee pits were the midfield at Broxburn Juniors, and I was the assistant manager. And we managed to take them into which is now the Lowland League. So we were the Super League in the East, which is now basically the Lowland League. So we got them into Tier Five. So I'd probably say wee pits is dad. Wee pits is dad had a good influence on me from a footballing point of view, but also from a character point of view, showing me what management, how he managed the coaching side of the game and how different it was. Wee pits his dad was played at a very, very good level and he played um, under some top managers. So it would probably be Stevie Pittman, to be honest. Just you talking there about obviously coming out for being in prison and then going into that, you know, assistant manager player um, role. For, for obviously, I mean, there'll be younger people listening to this as well, and, and for younger people in this part of Scotland, and I suppose all over Scotland, if something like, if a setback like that in your life happens to you, I would imagine, you know, there's a lot of them that maybe want to put their head down and go down a different path, and you see them, you see it every day, going in and out of prison, etc, etc. For yourself, what was the drive for you? Was it just that light bulb moment to say, no, actually, I'm going to go and make something of myself, I'm going to go and do this, I'm going to go and prove that that was just a mistake in my life, and was that always the driving factor for you to get to where you're now? Yeah, probably. I don't know. I always, I was always chasing the bigger things in life. Like always chase, probably putting the money, money before career aspirations. Like I never had a bit of paper that said David Martindale was good at this. When I got arrested, got charged up. If I'm honest with myself, I probably knew this day was coming for the last twelve years potentially. I knew that someday that I was going to get a knock in the door, but you probably try and talk yourself into being clever and it'll no happen to me, all that kind of thing. But all my pals, my social circle, that was fairly normal. That was kind of the life we led. It wasn't until I eventually got charged. I thought I need to change my life. I, I, that was probably the catalyst to change my life. I knew I had to change my life previously, but that was the catalyst to changing my life. And I went and enrolled for university. 
and that played a huge part in my life. It took me, including going to prison, it probably took me seven, eight years to get my degree. I was at university two years before I got in prison from the time I got charged. I was then in a closed conditions for around two years and then when I came out into open conditions, the university allowed me back in one day uh, when I got out from my home leave, I used to go into university and they give me a USB stick. I'd give them the USB stick and I'd done that for 18 months. And then they allowed me to come back into university full time and I got a release from prison. So all in all, it probably took me eight years to get my Bachelor of Science degree, so my honours degree. And I think having that wee bit of paper behind me, a different skill set behind me, I never had the scheme skill set, I never relied on my, how do you put it? The skills you learnt from growing up in the scheme, if that makes sense, I now had a different, I now had a bit of paper that says, by the way, David Martin deals, a value member of society and I can go and start applying for jobs. And I had my honours degree in construction project management. I started looking into the football, I was getting a wee bit older at that point, maybe 34, 35. Came out, my partner had stuck by me, we got married, um, we had a wee girl. And just my life kind of totally changed, totally changed. But it changed in April, I think it was April 2004 I got arrested. It changed in April 2004. But going to university, education was the key to turning my life around. And obviously when I came back out of prison, I had I had a strong footballing background from the West Lovian community. And that gave me an opportunity to get back into playing football and coaching football and kind of took off for there. And you, you mentioned you didn't get involved in construction, but while, in, while involved in construction, obviously you had an eye in football um, because you wanted to work part-time as a volunteer. No, no works, a volunteer, but for Livingston. And I yeah. suppose that started the, the, the proper association that you obviously it's led to where you are now. Um, how, how easy how how easy was it getting into Livingston as a volunteer? Because we know some people can have the old aspersions in their head you know, already and make their mind up on people just by what they've done in their past. Is that why you kind of Livingston's been such a big part of your life? Obviously, it's because they accepted yeah. that about you and, and took you in. And I think well, what what actually happened is like Livingston had a charity partner, the West Lovain Youth Foundation, it was called. And my pal worked with him. He was he worked at the big lottery, but he was seconded to the West Lovain Youth Foundation. So he worked hand in hand with the football football club on a daily basis. The football club is in a bad way; lost a lot of money. Most of the staff had disappeared, they'd been let go. They were in the championship, but they were down the bottom, bottom of the championship. No money, other than the money that you get for being in the championship. Low crowd numbers, place was a bit of a mess. And Billy said, look, one of my friends is looking to get in, maybe could help you with helping around the stadium, but I think he's really looking to get into the coaching side of football. And the boy who was in at the club at that time was a guy called Neil Rankin and Gordon McDougall. And I had a meeting with Neil, and Neil said, look, what is it you could do? I said, well, I could like, come in and help with the construction side of these things, kind of try and get the club in a better place, the infrastructure. I says, but I'm not just going to do that for no return. I said, for that, I, would, I, want, I want to be part of joint, like the coaching staff, i.e., can I come in and help out? I'll pick cones up, I'll blow balls up. And John McGinn, I had a meeting with John and Neil, and John said, look, come in. And I came in a Tuesday morning and a Thursday morning. And before you know it, before you knew it, it was basically you were in here nearly five days a week helping out in the morning with the coaching side of it. Not doing a lot for the first team point of you're not having a physical involvement in picking the team or the coaching, but helping. And then um, in the afternoons, I would jump about and get people in, painters in, joiners in, electricians in, people that I'd met or had contacts with in the construction industry. And I just started to help the club out. It got to the point, a couple of years into that, John John got sacked after, well, John left by mutual consent, that's a lie. John left by mutual consent after six months and Mark Butchell got the job. And Mark grew up in Livingston. I grew up in Livingston. A lot of my uh, early years grew up in Livingston and um, kind of knew of Mark. He knew of me. We had mutual pals that played amateur football, that kind of thing. And Mark was brilliant. Mark, Mark kind of let me into the boat, let me into the coaching staff a little bit more. Um, and Neil, Neil and Gordon, who were on the club, asked me to kind of take over the player recruitment side. Um, that was probably eighteen months into the into the job. 
And then after 18 months, Mark had lost his job. Um, and basically, David Hopkins was in coaching me, Mark. And Hoppy said, look, Davey, I like working with you. get on really well with you. Would see if I got the job, would you be interested in coming in and being the assistant manager? And it kind of worked because the club were quite happy to take my advice in that one because I'd kind of put Hoppy forward for that because I knew Hoppy well at that point. And that was it. It kind of snowballed the club. We got relegated the first six months we were in charge. The last six months, sorry, we got relegated. And that was probably the first proper, proper introduction I had at Livingston where I was responsible. Me and Hoppy were responsible for that. But um, um, I talked the club into keeping us on, basically. But that year, we, we were into League One. And basically, the boys that were running the club gave me a big bunch of keys and said, look, we're away. We're away. And that was me. I was left holding the keys for Livingston Football Club. One of the local businesses, a guy called John Ward, um, said, look, I used to sponsor the first team shot. I could come in and give you a wee hand, Davy." And that's what John did. I had a couple of local sponsors, Braidwood Motors, Neil Hogarth, Brian Ewing, boys that had been in and around the club but never really worked at the club. They all came in as volunteers, made a board up. Gordon Ford was the president and John came in and if I needed some money for wages, John would stick 20 grand in with the, the view of getting the money back in two or three months' time. And me and Hoppy built a team that year in League One and we got promoted. So we got promoted straight back up to the championship, broke all records in League One, um, won so many games, so many games undefeated, most goals, scores, least goals conceded, and we got the club back into the championship for the first time we asked him. Um, and I kind of the role just grew. I just took over running the football club for that initial year in League One. Um, there was there was a board on paper, but there wasn't really anybody here on a daily basis, bar myself. Somebody sold an advertising board. I'd put it up if the fire alarm went off <laughs> six in the morning. I'd come in and make sure that's the fire terrible. alarm. That's kind of what we've done. You see the fact, thing is, see, see the thing is, so David, see like you're saying there, like that was your introduction to coaching, basically, right? And you kind of through whatever happened, obviously sad mm -hmm. for Livingston, whatever happened financially, etc. But you see young coaches nowadays, and like they're handed B teams or they're handed, you know, under 12s, under 13s, yeah. 14s, whatever, allowed their chance to go and cut their teeth if you like, you know. Yeah. Yourself, you were just kind of flung right in there, albeit as assistant manager and know the manager, but it's still a hell of a lot of responsibility when you say you were responsible along yeah. with David Ockett for that team. I basically just ran the club. It was predominantly more the footballing department, but I was there every day. I was the only one that was here every day, and people would come and see me for a non-footballing point of view. Um, but I had a lot of support from guys like um, Gordon Ford, John Ward, Neil Hogarth, Brian Ewan, boys that were local businesses that would pop in, make sure everything's all right, you okay, David, that type of thing, what else do we need, how can we help? So they were really good. But for a footballing point of view, I just kind of got left to my own devices and me and Hoppy. Me and Hoppy worked really well together. And Hoppy, then I would say Hoppy was a huge influence on how I coach, how I viewed football. We were different, but we 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 coached the same way. It was, it's hard to explain. Like Hoppy's, Hoppy played top, top level. I never played anywhere near that level. But we kind of knew how to win games of football. And I think the two of us dovetailed very well together. So we won League One, got promoted back to the Championship, got in the Championship, and um, was that year? I think Rangers were still in the league that year, maybe. Maybe Rangers had been promoted, but the first year I was there, Rangers, Hearts and Hibs were in the league. So we still had some big teams in that league. No, Rangers were away, I tell you, like Rangers had been promoted the year we got relegated. Um, we came back into the Championship, and we managed to get a team to the Premier League. So we won back-to-back -back promotions. Um, for League One straight up relegated for the championship to League One after six months of being in charge. Won League One pretty comfortable, and then really, really unlucky if I'm honest. Naughty actually got at first time of asking through winning the uh, championship, but we managed to get there through the playoffs. So we got back to back promotions and we found ourselves in the Premier League. Um, hopping and that was, when, was that when David was that when David Hopkins. Left then? Yeah, I think he, Hoppy, he left it. Hoppy was very honest with me. Hoppy seen it as an opportunity to maybe get. But listen, see, we were a million miles, and I mean, I mean this in the nicest possible way. We were a million miles away from being a Premier League club in terms of 
everything bar probably the coaches at the club and the football players at the club, everything else, we were a million miles away from it. Um, and like to be to put you in the picture, our budget, budget, see the budget, nobody believes me. My budget in League One was £275,000. That was what the budget was in League One. I had boys in 300 quid a week, 400 quid a week. That was our top wage, £400 a week. Way to the championship, the budget went up to £375,000. That was the budget in the championship. Top wage, top wage in the championship was £500. I had one player, I tell a lie, one player on five fifty, and the rest were £500. So promoted to the Premier League, and for finishing 12th in the Premier League, the club, every, if you finished 12th in the Premier League, I think it was like £1.27 million you got, and the clubs went to me, like, well, that's your budget, go and spend it. That's what you got. Everybody that was on £500 went to £750 a week. Thought we were millionaires. Thought we were brilliant. 50% pay rises. Um, and Hoppy, Hoppy, Hoppy knew his stock was high. And he, I think, I think, to be honest, in hindsight, he's probably a wee bit early, but he's, Hoppy was desperate to get down the road to try his managerial down the road because that's where Hoppy played the majority of his football. He played top, top level. So Hoppy would say to me, look, I've got a few offers. I think I'm going to try my luck down south, which is crack on, crack on. Um, he had a couple of opportunities at clubs. I don't want to say what clubs. And he'd say to me, would you be interested in coming? I'd say, well, we'd need to cross that bridge when it came. It never really came to anything. And obviously, we started the season. I was still in place at Livingston. And then Hoppy got the Bradford job. But by that point, I was in place at Livingston for the season. I was more than happy to stay at Livingston. But I think nobody nobody felt that we would go on and do as well as we've done in the Premier League. Probably everybody thought Livingston would go up and then they'd go straight back down. So Hoppy's thought process at that point was probably correct, if I'm honest. And if you looked at the club, you had myself, Hoppy, a physio, a kit man, a part-time goalie coach, and um, a part-time strengthening, um, no, sorry, a full-time strength and conditioning coach. But the wages on offer, everything, the finances and infrastructure at the club was a million miles away from being a Premiership football club. Did you see that then, obviously with David leaving, but did you see that as a a free hit that season then to say that, OK, if we do get relegated, we're getting a parachute payment, if you like, or did you have ambitions even then to say, no, actually, we can stay up? It, well, it was, it was a wee bit difficult. I'd never coached in the Premier League, never played in the Premier League, but you could have said that for every division I've been involved in. But I thought that was a big thing going into that league. Um, Hoppy had left, so I was kind of isolated. I was alone in that respect, because all, all we've ever had was me and Hoppy taking training. It's all we ever had in a part-time goalie coach come in on a Tuesday and a Thursday morning. So I kind of felt a wee bit isolated there. Um, but at no point did I ever think, do you know what? We've got to go back down. I, I kind of the philosophy at the club's always been just one game at a time, just one game at a time. I don't really look too far ahead, and even to this day, it's kind of how I coach one game at a time. Um, I don't really look too far into the future, I don't look at oh, this could happen or that could happen. I just take one game at a time and see come the end of the season what will be, will be, and I give it my best shot every game, as do the players. You think you can see that? <laughs> There's no many games at Livingston or lose where. The appetite, the desire, and the intensity has not been there. You might get battered with the ball off the old firm, but we'll still go out there and give it a right good goal. Um, and that's kind of how we've always coached this one game at a time. And it's how I've always probably, that's how my life has been since probably I got charged in 2004 because I knew I was going to prison, but I never went to prison in October 2006. So it kind of got me into the mindset you just take every day as it comes. And it's kind of been like that ever since 2004, if I'm honest. It's not spot. And listen, it's 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 probably the right way to be because so many people do, in football and in life in general, think about what's coming up and what's coming up. Mm. I mean, as Rangers supporters, you know, we, we'll look ahead to, for instance, tomorrow night, the Champions League. But in doing so, you underestimate Livingston on the Saturday in the opener of the league. Yeah. And if you lose that game or drop points there, you've started in a disaster and you're going to the game in Belgium. It's a nightmare. Nice. So you've got to take it one game at a time. I think I think is like a fan of the old firm, no doubt Rangers. I think it's easy to get into that thought process, but you maybe I don't know what the exact stat is, but you look at Rangers and Celtic fans, they probably win 75% of their games. 
So for me, it's easy to come into with that mindset as a supporter and a coach and a player. Yeah. That is, it's easy because history tells you that's what's going to happen. Whereas at Livingston, we had a fantastic season. We had a good season last year, had a fantastic season the season before. Season before, I won 12 games of football. That's what I won. 12 games of football out of 38. So I won roughly 33% of our games. So it kind of leads you to that mindset. It's probably how you deal with the lows more so than, than the highs. So you come in with that mindset. Eh? Like, listen, it's happened. There's nothing we can do about it. I can't affect the past. I can only affect the future. And that's probably the mental resilience that I've probably built up from, obviously, what happened to me in April 2004, is I can only yeah. affect the future. I can't change the past. And I kind of take that philosophy into football. How did your mindset change in terms of coaching then? Because obviously, League One, you smash records, etc. get promotion. The Championship, get promoted. Technically, probably punch above your weight in the Championship, really, yeah. when you think about it, considering what happened. And then you get into the Premier League. How does your mindset flip? Because you've you've went for League One being the dominant team, really, and and you know winning games, winning more games than, than not. How how does the mindset flip for you as a coach then? Because you you obviously need to prepare your players for that. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's eleven guys against eleven guys on a Saturday. Paper goes out the window in terms of form and and yeah. or Rangers or Livingston, whoever it is, should win this. So how do, how do you prepare players for that mentally? I just take every game one game at a time. I, I, I think like you could have went out Saturday we could have got beat 5-0 and I've been here saying the same things to you. We put a good performance on, we were unlucky you not know, to pick points up. But if that was Hamilton, Kilmarnock and we got beat 2-1, the philosophy doesn't change. The work methods, the process at the club, it doesn't change. I think I've got a good structure at the club now. It's been six years where I've properly been in charge at the club, i.e. from a footballing point of view. Um, I've had a huge influence on the footballing point of view. Obviously, I had Hoppy was a manager, Holt, he was a manager, but we all worked really close together. I don't feel any different now from when I was an assistant from being the manager. I don't feel any different. The only thing that's different is I do the media. It's the only thing that's different. My daily job's not changed. Um, as opposed to me and Hoppy and me and Holt, it's me and Marv. Nothing's, <laughs> nothing's yeah. really changed, but... I don't. I look at the opponent. And I look at. I try and do a SWOT analysis. We do a lot of. There's probably a lot goes on behind the scenes that goes unnoticed at Livingston, and probably fans of other clubs or even maybe fans of our own club look at and go, oh, they work really hard. There's a lot of game plan. There's a lot of detail goes into every individual fixture. There's a process at the club that I like to stick to, evolve, and I tweak it every year to suit because you can't keep doing the same things. But there's a lot of detail goes into this club. And what really helped is in the championship year was the continuity for the squad in League One. So we kept the continuity from winning League One and going into the championship. And if you look at some of these players to this day, you just mentioned three that, well, probably more than that, but you look at the players that got us promoted for the championship. Craig Halkett, he's captain of Hearts last year at times. Liam Kelly, captain of Motherwell, Scotland cap. Craig Halkett, Scotland cap. Declan Gallagher was his captain at Motherwell, moved to Aberdeen, but he was playing with Scotland in the Euro qualifiers. Um, Ryan Hardy playing in League One in England at Plymouth. So Jordan Thompson playing in the Championship at Stoke. So there was a, there was a lot of good players at that club also, um, which made life in the Premier League a little bit easier as well. So we kept the vast majority of our squad because... Every one of the players thought it was absolutely brilliant. Their wages are went up by 50%. So they went from 500 to 750, which is the top paid player at that point. And fair play to every one of them. They, they signed the contracts. What happened the next year was most clubs found out, by the way, look at Livy's. You know what, Livy's paying mum will go and take their best players. And that's kind of what happened to me that year. I'll give you 1,500 quid a week. I'll give you 1,800 quid a week to players. Well, bing, 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 bing. But again, that's understandable. It's football. There's such a short window for players to maximise their earning potential that they've got to go and take it. They've got to go and take that money. That's why they're in football. They earn a good living. And when they, the money is, the grass is greener when it comes to the financials. Generally, that's generally what I found out in football. So, Gary Holt comes in. Um, did you said your job obviously hasn't changed to even you now being the main man there, never mind the assistant. 
Was there any fears for yourself for Gary coming in about that maybe you wouldn't be part of it, or was it always made clear oh, that you were going to be part of it? Gary. Oh, did yeah. you actually? Did you actually? Right. I interviewed him. I interviewed Gary. Got back. Got we had a lot of mutual friends for Scotland seniors because I was playing with Scotland seniors as well. Um, and Gary, so I came out of the Scotland seniors in the championship season, got into the Premier League. I thought I can't go away in the summer for two weeks and play in this tournament, put too much on. You need to keep the team in the Premier League, obviously. And there was a lot of folk phoning me saying, Look, you and Gary Holt, Gary Holt's got his pro license. Remember, at this point, I don't even think I've got a coaching badge. I think I've got. No, I'll tell you a lie. I've got my 1.3. I've done my 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. I had my SFA coaching badges. They wouldn't let me on my C licence, kept knocking me back. They wouldn't let me on my B licence. So at that point, I needed someone with a pro licence or an A licence in the technical area um, for the club guide, uh, club academy stuff, you know, your football regulations. Yeah. So Holty came in and Holty said, look, David, I know what you do at the club. I want to come in and be a part of you. I'm not looking to come in and change anything to his or work together. And that's what we've done. The exact same Happy. as me and Hoppy. Hoppy was a manager, but me and Hoppy done everything together. At the end of the day, it was up to Hoppy at that point, probably, if I'm at Hoppy, I'm not sure about that. Hoppy would, well, I'm a manager, I'm, I'm going to play that. That's perfect. But very, very little did me and Hoppy ever disagree in it. But the final decision came with Hoppy. Same with recruitment. If a player came in, Hoppy, look, I've got this boy. I like him. I say, I like him as well. We're going to get it done. I was very, very rarely any time Hoppy said to me, I like this boy, or I've said to Hoppy, I like that boy, and Hoppy said no, or I've said no. We just worked together and we made it work. And it was the same with Holty. Holty came in, he said, I know everything you do, Davey. Um, I was looking to take more of the training anyway, because Hoppy wasn't here. We weren't changing what was going on at the club. So I kind of felt Hoppy's shoes, albeit Holty was the manager, we just worked really closely together. And I think in modern day football, I think you can see that more and more now. And if you look at how clubs are ran, I don't think it works at clubs when you bring a manager in, it's all his own staff, all his own staff. And when he leaves, there's eight people leave a football club. I think you lose a lot of the continuity in the building. So for me, with Hoppy leaving, I was looking to keep that continuity in the building. And Holy was brilliant. Holy came in and said, perfect, perfect. I'm looking for a job. Let's see how we get on. The two is two is worked well together. Nothing really changed. I didn't really change anything I was doing on a daily basis. Holty fell into how we worked, opposed to I fell into how Holty worked. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. And it's the same with Mars. Mars came in and Mars fell into how we worked. And yeah. that's kind of what we all do. As you say, the structure remains the same and people yeah. come in and adapt to that. And that's what we found when Stephen Gerrard left. We lost a lot of the coaching staff. Yeah. Who had built it, and, and it was like going back to the start again. And, and you didn't just lose lose Stephen, you lost Mike Beal, you lost Tom oh, Culshaw, you lost John Milsom. You, we've now lost the, the doc. Um, I know. You Dr. know, it's, Lester. Ah, Dr. Lester. Oh. So it's it's one of the things that I quite like that, that what you've just said there that you I know, the, the, the philosophy I think remains it's important. And if and like, I know it's kind of a Rangers podcast, this type of thing, but we're talking football. You look at Celtic, who've done it a little bit differently and kept that structure. Yeah. So, like, Lenny left. Everybody else was still in the building. Ange came in. Ange came in alone. The structure was still there. Now, you can say successful or no successful. He's won the league. He's yeah. won the league with that structure. You then look at Ange's now built. He's brought Harry Kuehl in, and he's got an extra member of his coaching staff, which yeah. is an extension of him. Who's to say the Celtic structure doesn't work because it's had success previously by doing that? You look at Rangers, they've had success with Stephen, but there's also had success with bringing Gio and his staff into the club. But yeah. I think now what you probably find is there's less of Gio's staff. If Gio was to leave tomorrow, there would be less people left the building what happened when Stephen left the job. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's got to be the way forward. And, and modern clubs, I think, I personally, me, I think continuity in football is absolutely huge, and especially at the top, top clubs. When I was a young boy, my father said to me, put this scarf around your neck and sing the blues with me. And now I am much older, there's a place I want to be. It's red for said it's beautiful It's steeped in history And I know what 
I'm fine when the place comes alive. I got that battle fever coming over me, and I got butterflies and hurricanes shaking my body. Please.